Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. Today we're going to talk about a couple of books that have to do with the night side of things, if you will. The uh, things that happen under the moon. First we have Mistress of the Night by Dave Gross and Don Bassingthwaite. Now, here's the odd thing. Dave Gross almost always writes about werewolves. It's just, that's his niche, I guess. He's like the werewolf expert. And uh, Don Bassingthwaite, I don't really know much about. But I'm assuming since half of this book focuses on werewolves, that's the half that Dave Gross had the most impact on or helped write the most. However, it is the most boring half of the book, which is weird because normally I like Dave Gross. I don't know, though. It uh, didn't work in here for me. The other half of the book, however, I really liked. So the werewolf half is, um, uh, we're, <laughs> we're in the town of, or the city of Yawn, which I think just kind of sums it up all right there, really. So in the city of Yawn, the, uh, the Order of Saloon is having some issues, and the, the, the chick who runs it is, uh, she needs to study some stuff that's going on, so she calls in her you know, kind of black sheep werewolf member and makes her a uh, high priestess or whatever for a while. And uh, so she can focus on her research, which for so many reasons just seems... I'm totally blanking on the word that I want here, but it's convoluted in order to service the plot. It's forced, and it's not believable in any way. And the end of the book is kind of the obvious answer that should have been the answer from day one, which is her making her making the right hand woman at her side the high priestess because you know she knows more about running the place, etc., etc., etc. It's just it's like why wouldn't she have just done that from page one? I don't know, kind of silly. And and then you know the chick who takes over. Uh, the, the ex-high priestess, like, tricks her into turning her into a werewolf, and then the, the chick who was already a werewolf just kills her, because she's like, Oh, you can't stand this curse! There are the police. That's common occurrence here at my new place. Yeah, so, I don't know, I just didn't feel connected to any of that, and it's sad, because... Normally, Saloon, I, I enjoy the Saloon stuff. Uh, I, I, I don't know, I find her interesting, and I like the werewolf aspect, and so on and so forth. The nice thing about this is that it is a priest's book, and we see two sides, kind of, of the same coin. Uh, half of it's about the Saloon conspiracy and everything, and then the other half is about Char. Also going on in Yawn, there is a resurgence of the, uh, the Char cult or whatever you want to call it and we're focusing on one character who comes from a family of magicians but he's not a magician himself and uh he's kind of the black sheep of their family you know nobody really likes him um and nobody really knows what to do with him so he kind of acts out and becomes this problem child and he's recruited by the char agents and he sees this as a chance, really more than anything disruptive, he sees it as a chance to maybe practice clerical magic, so he goes for it. And the woman who inducts him has one of the best names that I've seen in the realm's variants. I think that's just such a cool name, and it's a real word, so it, you know, it, I don't know, really worked for me. I think a lot about names. Climax is whatever, you know, this book is just kind of, I, I mean, it's just kind of there. It's, it's not bad, and the ordeal with the kid who's inducted into the Shar conspiracy or cult or whatever is, it, it just kind of goes the completely predictable route, which I was really sad about because, you know, I, I, I really want to see a book about somebody who takes the darker path. And uh, give me about a minute and a half here. Um, and uh, <laughs> and it, it frustrates me that all these times we have these build-ups with people who join a cult or whatever. And it's like, I guess to me it feels like if you have these people who are in such situations that 
they're willing to do the wrong thing up to a certain point, but then goodness always wins out in their heart. Where do all the hundreds or thousands or whatever, I mean, the, as big as the realms is, the hundreds of thousands of, of people who do the wrong thing come from? You know, it's like, if everybody in the end can see the error of their ways, then why is Shar still a viable deity? I mean, it just, it to me, it seems very, very frustrating and kind of silly so yeah i was um uh, I'm, I'm just i'm getting kind of tired of that there are a couple of fun little twists one of the last twists is finding out variants with something that i believe is called a shade someone who has given themselves over to shadow and it's like dun 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 you know like they're really scary and powerful and way beyond the scope of like you know, what? what is normal uh, in the realms, and especially like a book like this, we can't get into it. So, now over to Midnight's Mask, the end of the Erebus Kale trilogy. <laughs> Starring Erebus Kale, a shade. You know, I mean, granted he didn't become a shade until the end of book one, but still. He's now fully been a shade for a book and all of this book. So, you know, the part two, uh, which I believe is Twilight Falling, I keep getting the, the uh, names mixed up, but, you know, part two I was not that thrilled with, though I thought it had a strong ending. So, what did I think of the end of the trilogy? I'm blown away. I am just seriously in shock. This book, holy crap. It starts out with... <laughs> it's like... Um, Oh, I'm trying to think of some... Okay, so, I don't know. It's like the first episode of Alias times, like, seven. Because there's this whole thing where, you know, they're all thinking about Riven's betrayal. And and the rest of our team realizes, oh, we put this psionic, like, thing in his head so that he would betray us because it would be believable and it would give him a chance to get close to the Sojourner. Riven doesn't remember it until the Sojourner pops up, and then he's like, but holy crap, the Sojourner's really powerful. I should be following him. Uh, and all the reasons that, you know, I, I betrayed Erebus for, I'm pretty much okay with those reasons, so I'm going to keep betraying him. And And then it's like, so he does actually switch sides, but then he doesn't, and then... I mean, there's all this switch, 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 switch with Ray, Ray, uh, Riven. You never really know where he's going to fall. And I thought that was a lot of fun. And in fact, one of the reviews on the back of the trilogy says something about how this is a story about, I don't know, the craziness that can result in two people believing the same thing. So I honestly thought this was going to come down to a showdown between Riven and Kale. It doesn't, and I don't know what that quote was talking about, really, because... It really isn't anything about that. But, in any case, there's just a, a ton of great stuff with Riven and Kale. There's this whole section where the Sojourner is clearing out this castle. Uh, he turns, I'm trying to remember what it is, uh, he turns a, a temple of one of the good gods, anyway, and he, he or or no, 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 it's um it's a, a temple of Sirik, that's what it is takes this temple of Sirik and, and kills them all because, you know, Mask and Sirik, not on the best terms or whatever. Or wait, is the Sojourner? I, I can't read it. Anyway, he uses the temple of Sirik and clears it out of everybody. And that was one section that I just kind of skipped because it's like there's this one chapter where it starts, and it's a fairly interesting chapter. You get to see some of the ways that he uses high-level spells to take out this entire garrison without ever once encountering a human being, you know, um, in person. And that was kind of fun. But then it keeps going on for like two or three more chapters, and it was like, really? But beyond that, the rest of it is just awesome. And the climax... First of all, the climax, you have kind of the the big badass awesome fight between the slotty you know the the final slotty and um, our group and it is intense crazy you know all over the place balls to the wall just awesome and and once that is over it, it goes to essentially kale versus the sojourner and the build-up to that is so like it made me think of you know in Aliens when Ripley is uh, going down the elevator and testing the flamethrower and you just have this feeling of like oh god oh god oh god because 
you know that this is just intense, this is just big, but it has this way more personal feel than the big, like, uh, sort of battle. And the Sojourner's reasons for doing everything that he's done for these three books is friggin' brilliant. It is the most interesting villain grandmaster plan that I've seen in any of the Realms books, and I'd say probably better than, like, 75% of the books that I've ever read. Like, it is just so interesting. And I, I'll i be honest, I kind of wish that there had been a little more done with that. Like, I, I, I almost kind of wish... Does anybody remember the end of the first Dark Tower book where uh, the gunslinger catches up to the man in black or whatever he's called in there and they just talk about the universe for a, a chapter or two? That, to me, is almost what I wish would have happened in this book. Like, I really... Like, I, I mean, it's there. It's like four exchanges and that's about it. But um, I, I almost kind of wish that they had... You know, like, Erebus, once he finds out the grand plan, if he would have just been kind of winded for a bit. And the Sojourner, because he's he essentially accomplishes everything that he sets out to accomplish. So, you know, he's kind of happy to die and happy to talk. If they just kind of would have talked a bit about the way that they see life and what they want out of it and so on and so forth, things like that, I think I would have enjoyed the climax a little bit more. Not saying it fell short in any way, shape, or form, but that's kind of what I was expecting. In any case, just an amazing wrap-up to this trilogy, and the epilogue with Riven is just so beautiful. Like, I, I, I absolutely love Riven's character. I don't think I can say anything more about it without getting too spoilerish, and I really don't want to spoil this because I want you to experience it for yourself. Um, if you have not read the Kale trilogy, definitely go out and read it. Don't worry about Shadow's Witness. You really don't need it, and it's a little tough to find now, so don't worry about that, but go grab the Kale trilogy. Read it. Trust me, you're going to thank me. It's really, really good. Next time, I think we'll finish off another trilogy, The Scions of Erebar, and uh, keep moving forward on the Byers trilogy, Year of Rogue Dragons. This is going to be kind of a big section where we're knocking down trilogies, I hope. So, uh, so that'll be exciting. All right, uh, that's it for me. Uh, for this episode, I'm Michael T. Bradley. You're listening to Realms Remembered.